Let's begin by telling you that the Kano High Court has ordered the deposed Emir of Kano, Amino Adobayero, to stop parading himself as Emir. The court also directed the police commissioner to evict him from the mini palace on State Road. The court, presided over by Justice Amina Adamu Aliu, gave the order on Monday. Similarly, the order restrained Alhaji Nasiru Adobayero, Ibrahim Abubakar II, Kabiru Mohammed Inua, and Alaji Ali Ibrahim Gaya from parading themselves as Emirs of Vichy, Gaya, Rano, and Karai. In the meantime, the deposed Emir of Kano, Amino Adobayero, held a mini carnival at his Gidan Nasarawa Palace in Kano State. The royal father received his supporters and followers amidst widespread jubilation as he welcomed them to the palace. News Central Simano Bagudu reports. Adobayero is currently residing. He's been backed by the court and his supporters are very happy to be with him all the time. Right now they are waiting for his arrival. Traditionally he's expected to come out in a royal horse to address them, to smile at them and they appreciate them for all their support. After a few moments of waiting, the trumpets began to sound and the royal horse was released for the Emir Aminu Adobayero to mount. Like his rival, Mohammed Sanusi II, the deposed Emir continued to receive homage amidst chants of praises from his subject. The governor should have to follow the instructions of the court for sacking the Emirs. The governor don't have the right to sack our Emir. He's a brother, that is, the person we are calling Sanusi. If the people have a mind, in God in mind, it cannot, it's, not, it's not the type of person who can bring this problem to the Kano people. There are the people who love Kano people. There are the people who love themselves better than people. In two days, they created the laws without following due process, without uh, public hearing. Like we have uh, this guy, Rano, Karai, you have to call on those people, go and meet them. Do you like this emerald or you don't like them? Then you can, you can do whatever you, the people decide because it's government of the people by the people for the people. Let me cite an example. For now, who is the governor of Kanu? Abba Kabir Yusuf is the governor of Kanu. So for a couple of days, he has been sleeping in the palace. Nothing stops him from being a governor because he sleeps in the palace. He's still a governor. So the Emir is still the Emir. This, whether he's in the main palace or here, here is also another palace. So, 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 and he's the one that, uh, that has been recognized by the law. So, so, so by law, Emir Aminu is the Emir. And that was another victory parade, but this time from the court-backed Emir of Keno, His Royal Highness Aminu Ado Bayero. The wait continues until June, where the final judgment will be delivered and the new Emir of Keno will be announced. In Keno State for News Central, I'm Emmanuel Bagudu. And still joining me to give more updates on this is News Central's correspondent, Emmanuel Bagudu. Uh, Emmanuel, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we just watched a report of um, the mini carnival that was held in honor of um, the deposed Emir of Kano, that is um, Ado Bayero. Uh, what do you make of that mini carnival? Because some people feel that it could be a ploy to garner more support uh, for him. Yeah, it was so interesting to find out that uh, the Emir is confident that he's still... Uh, Emir Aminu Adobayero, as at yesterday, caught back Emir, as at yesterday, he was parading himself as Emir. And then, of course, the carnival was so interesting because a lot of dignitaries attended it. So, I mean, yesterday was was something to go by. I mean, he was so confident uh, to, you know, parade himself as an Emir. So, we, as at yesterday, we had two Emirs in Kano. And that is so, so, so uh, freakish, looking at the uh, Kanu and the Hausa traditional community. That is the situation as I guessed today.
Okay, it's interesting. Uh, two emirs in Kano and now two court rulings that we have to battle with. Now, we have a fresh Kano High Court ruling versus a purportedly virtually delivered ruling by the Federal High Court. Now, what are the feelers that you've been getting from both camps as regards these two rulings? Yeah, the, the court ruling that, that, that came in just last, yesterday, yesterday's evening was uh, coming in from the Federal High Court. The Federal High Court supersedes any other court in Nigeria. Uh, a lot of people are saying that, um, the people from the Amino uh, side are saying that the issue is a state issue. You recall that um, when uh, they got the expert motion, when they go and they secured the ruling that uh, status quo should be maintained, and Amino Bayero remains the Amy of Kano as at three, four days ago, they were saying that, uh, of course, that, that the state uh, ruling, state uh, judicial ruling, supersedes any other. Now today, uh, Federal High Court came out to tell us that, of course, Amin Dubero should be arrested. He's, he's not supposed to parade himself as, an, as the Emir. And then, of course, the four, the four other uh, Emirates, Gaia, Bichi, Karaye, uh, that should be, should, 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 they are no longer Emirates. And, they should, and the Emir should stop those uh, people that were Emirs before should stop parading themselves as Emir. They are saying that um, the Federal High Court actually is lower than the State High Court. So it's confusion all over. So that is the situation right now in Kano. So by, by evening, we are going to give you an update of the situation of the police because our interest right now is to, because police, uh, the Nigerian police said they, they are interested in following court orders, whether wrong or right. They made it clear to us yesterday that they are interested, they are, their duty is to follow court orders, whether wrong or right. That was why they were protecting Aminu Ado Bayaro as at two days ago. Uh, but so, Emmanuel, uh, Emmanuel, the court, yeah. I'll be around what court ruling will the uh, police in Kano State be following? Because um, the High Court ruling has directed the police commissioner to evict Aminu Ado Bayaro, and there's another court ruling saying that he should not be touched. So, um, of course, you are on ground. What do you think? Because, of course, the police seems to be at a crossroad right now. Everybody seems to be confused. Uh, what court really do you think um, the uh, police in the state would actually be following? Of course, of course. Uh, the police just got the court. The court ruling just came in yesterday this evening. And uh, between yesterday and now, I believe the police by now must have gotten the details from the court. And our interest right now is to follow up and see whether the police are going to act according to the latest, the latest, the latest court ruling. Because as I two days ago, they told us that, that the reason why they are protecting Ado Bayaro is because of the court ruling that says that status quo should be maintained and that Ado Bayaro still remains a of Kano. So what we are, what we are looking at, what we are looking at for right now is to find out whether or not the police are going to obey the latest court ruling. Because they told us a few days ago that their duty and their job is to follow court orders. And that is the reason why they have mounted themselves, strung themselves at uh, Amidu Ado Bayoro's residence at uh, Gidan Nasara, Gidan Sarkin Nasara. So that is what is happening right now. So we okay. are going to find that out in the next few minutes. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, uh, Emmanuel, quickly, before I let you go, um, the thoughts um, of those who actually attended the mini carnival might not really represent the total feeling or expectations of the people in Kano State. But then, according to what we know, the Commissioner for Information in the state, that is Baba Dantiye, reportedly said that residents in Kano are satisfied or welcome the reinstatement of um, Sanusi Lamido as the Emir of Kano. Well, you've been on the ground and you've been monitoring the process all through for the past couple of days that you've been there. What do you think the general feeling is like? Is it tilting towards uh, Sanusi Lamido or Adobayer? I will tell you it's 50-50. It's 50-50. It's 50-50. New Central actually display videos of Sanusi's palace and I know, I mean Adobayer's palace as at yesterday. It's 50-50. It's 50 50 as I speak to you, it's 50 50. You cannot rule out the fact that the two MERs are influential in their standards, in their spaces. So it's 50 50 as a, okay. as, as a new central can authoritatively report. Okay. It's 50 50. All right. Uh, Emmanuel Bagudo, thank you so much. We'll keep tabs with you anyway to get more details from you. Now away from that, the Bayosa and Kogi State Governorship Election Petitions Court sitting in Abuja have affirmed the victories of Governors Doye Diri of Bayelsa State and Usman Ododo 
of Kogi State in the November 11th uh, off-cycle polls. In a unanimous judgment, both tribunals held that the petitions were lacking in merit and the petitioners failed to prove their cases before the courts. Mabelos Obomano reports. A sound of victory and a clear reason to celebrate by supporters of the Bayelsa and Kogi State governors, chanting songs in celebration following the decision by both tribunals which reaffirmed the election victories of their principles. In the case of Bayelsa, Justice Adekunle Adeleye led three member tribunal dismissed the petition filed by the All Progressives Congress and its candidate, Timi Priye Silva, as lacking in merit. This did not go down well with the petitioner. Well, unfortunately, the decision was given by the tribunal today against us. We are officers in the Temple of Justice. We will study the judgments and then we shall decide what to do. The case of our opponents was built on a very weak foundation. And if you listen to the judgment, you see that their case, the evidence, was deficient both in quality and in quantity. And as the court said, the allegations were not proved. This judgment is fair, and I want all parties to accept this. You know, Kogi State belongs to each and every one of us, as we contribute not only in Kogi State but in Project Nigeria. But today's judgment has affirmed the victory of the incumbent governor. Also, the three-member panel of justices reviewing the Kogi State election, led by Justice Yusuf Brenin Kudu, held that the petitioners did not provide sufficient evidence to prove their case. Never in the history of our electoral matters did the petitioners in this case go the extra mile to secure beavers machines that were used for this election. And not only that, the contents were demonstrated in the open to the hearing of everyone in an attempt to prove overvoting. And the evidence in that regard was overwhelming. And that was supposed to be a game changer, a turning point in our electoral process. But in the judgment delivered, the tribunal, in its wisdom, decided to jettison the evidence of PW1 and INEC staff. The judgment has just been delivered. And uh, what would I say? We are happy that the way we have seen it from day one is exactly the way the tribunal has seen it by way of its judgment today. So we are happy. By this decision, all the legal disputes around the Imo, Bayelsa, and Kogi state elections have been laid to rest for now. The petitioners still reserve the right to appeal. In Abuja for News Central, Marvelous Oboman. Now, the Economic Community of West African States Judicial Council says that the enforcement of judgments of the community court has remained a major challenge affecting the effective delivery of their mandate. This was as the Chief Justices and Presidents of Supreme Courts of ECOWAS member states met in Abuja for the second time in 2024 to deliberate on how to move the council forward. Again, Marvelous Obomano reports. Gathered here in this room are members of the ECOWAS Judicial Council from member states of the sub-region. Their objective is to deliberate on issues affecting the effective operation of the community court. The members who had earlier met on the 19th to 22nd of February this year identified the non-enforcement of judgments of the court as a major challenge affecting the court. Members then set up a committee to recommend solutions on how to tackle this challenge. One of the committees was specifically touched with exploring pos possible ways of enhancing the enforcement of the court's decisions and the other to review the council's rules of procedure for a to better facilitate the operations of the court and the council itself. The enforcement of the judgments of the community court has remained a major issue in the effective delivery of the mandate and responsibility of the judicial institution to the community citizens. 
the ECOWAS Judicial Council says that it intends to recommend solutions to the ECOWAS Commission on how to improve access to justice in the sub-region. The challenges confronting the judiciary and justice system in general across the states are identical in terms of judicial autonomy, provision of funding and infrastructural facilities for the courts, among others. The council also discussed extensively the issues affecting the growth of democracy, credible elections and the recent spate of military takeovers in the region. The judiciary should rise to the occasion in helping to stem the factors that precipitate military incursion into governance, process of adherence to con conduct of free and fair elections and constitutional governance must be protected. In this era where instability and insecurity are overwhelming our community, the role of the judicial sector is crucial in conflict prevention through the promotion and defense of rule of law and human rights. I humbly urge all of us to contribute meaningfully to the deliberations for the two days ahead and develop concrete recommendations to be sent to the authority of heads of state and government to improve regional justice delivery in sub-region through the ECOWAS court. With the Judicial Council now keen on ensuring access to justice for citizens, it is hoped that this will grow democracy in the sub-region. In Abuja for News Central, Marvelous Oboman. The year 2024 has been a roller coaster ride for the Nigerian Naira. New Central's business correspondent, Papecha Fasumi Peter, who has been tracking the Naira in President Bola Ahmed Tinubu's first year, reports that it has been a year of promises, pronouncements, and policies aimed at taming inflation, stabilizing the exchange rate, and ultimately bringing some peace to the Nigerian Naira. But as the central bank achieved these goals under Governor Olaye Mikadoso, I will, will tell you more in this report. The budget that I've glimpsed. On May 29, 2023, Nigeria's president, Bola Tinubu, pledged to unify the country's exchange rate. And by June 14, the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, confirmed it had instituted a managed float, causing the Naira to depreciate from 464 Naira 50 Kobo to about 700 Naira within 24 hours. The way it is at the moment, uh, more businesses would fold up because you cannot do business in Nigeria without forex. We are, whether we like it or not, we are still heavily import dependent. And the only means of transaction is forex particularly dollars. Inflationary pressure. Olayemi Kadoso began his tenure as CBN governor on October 5, 2023, and in his November 24th speech, outlined the bank's new policy direction. Under my leadership, our monetary policies will aim to achieve price stability, foster economic growth, stabilize the exchange rate of the Naira, and reduce interest rates to facilitate borrowing and investment in the real sector. New foreign exchange guidelines and legislation will be developed and extensive consultations will be conducted with banks and FX operators before implementing any new requirements. In 2024, the Naira opened at 907 Naira 1 Kobo per dollar and depreciated by 37.6% to 1,455 Naira 59 Kobo by the end of January, with a single trading session drop of over 33% on Monday, 29th January. Everything is, is on the high side. Everything. But Naira, if Nigeria can even try, uh, our government can, if, let us stop of this using of uh, dollar. Because dollar, 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 ugu, they are calling dollar. Um, uh, tomatoes, uh, dollar is cost. So I don't know where the problem is, actually. To stabilize the market, the CBN issued several guidelines and circulars, including the harmonization of reporting requirements of foreign currency exposure of banks, removal of exchange rate limits, guidelines for bureau change operators, which has now been updated, and sale of dollars to BDCs.
Despite these efforts, the Naira fell further to 1,665 Naira 50 Kobo per dollar. In retail uh, trader like uh, Peru we are saying its capitalization is 2 billion. So that capitalization is a huge concern from 35 billion to 2 billion. On March 20, the CBN cleared a $1.5 billion forex backlog, and by Tuesday, March 26, the CBN raised the interest rate by 200 basis points, culminating in a 600 basis point hike in the first quarter of 2024. Consequently, the Naira gained significantly in the official and parallel markets, becoming the best performing currency globally in April. We have seen some level of stability in the foreign exchange market, with the Naira appreciating to about 1,245 Naira against the dollar. This is good news. However, I'm here to find out if that has trickled down to the prices of goods and services, especially food items. Food stuffs, I don't think that is going down now. So something like a gari now is going higher every day. Today now, a bag of gari, let's well, say for last week, we sold for 35K, but this week, it's 40k for a bag. Analysts explain the delay in price adjustment. The truth about economics is that prices are sticky when it comes to reversing. But when it's progressing, it's sporadic. So we might not see the increase, we might not see the change in near term. It might take as much as six months to nine months before you start seeing major difference. However, the recovery was short-lived as seasonal demand for forex soon caused the Naira to depreciate, leaving prices of some commodities and food items with no chance of recovery. By the end of the third MPC meeting in May, the CBN had hiked the interest rate by 750 basis points, adjusted the asymmetric corridor to plus 100 minus 700, the cash reserve ratio to 45%, and retained the liquidity ratio at 30% in a bid to stabilize the exchange rate and rein in inflation, which was already 33.69% in April 2024. Although the Naira to the dollar exchange rate on May 29, 2023 was 463 Naira 33 Kobo per dollar, one year later, the Naira now exchanges at about 1,500 Naira to the dollar. This is despite CBN's efforts to stabilize the exchange rate and curb inflation. With analysts expecting this inflation by Q3 2024, the Naira volatility persists, highlighting the need for consolidated fiscal and monetary policies to stabilize the economy and foster a sustainable business environment. In Lagos, for New Central, I am Perpetual Fasami Peter. Many thanks for staying with us. Now, the governor of Delta State, South South Nigeria, Sheriff Oborewori, has revealed that the needed past governor of the state, Ifanyo Kowa, doesn't influence decisions of governance in the oil-rich Niger Delta state. Members of the opposition parties in the state urged the governor to appoint capable individuals among them to advance the state's development. New Central's correspondent Austin Azu in this report seeks appraisal of the governor's one year in office. Governor Sheriff Oboriwori was sworn in on May 29, 2023, alongside other governors across Nigeria. He was the fifth democratically elected governor in Delta State. The governor was the immediate past speaker of the State House of Assembly, where he piloted the House affairs for six years. He was elected on the platform of the People's Democratic Party, and he hails from Osubi in open local government area of Delta Central Senatorial District of the state. The tasks, the things are tough, the choices not easy, but with your support and prayers, we shall get the job done. One year later, how has Governor Borewori managed the state resources and provided the people with good governance? And let me also remind you that he has not borrowed a dime from anywhere. And he's still paying, taking care of what he met on ground. So please, this man has done well. We're not just singing praises of him. And uh, I will tell you anytime, even in my dream, that Governor Sheriff is the Moses of our time. Everything he has done since his uh, assumption of office, he has done very well. And it's, uh, it's a governor that carries everybody along. You can see the unity in the state since he came. He's been trying to bring everybody together. The man is a wonderful man, a Toknadu governor, a governor that knows his onion. 
He knows what he's doing. But this APC senator very wants good. Governor Barewari to emulate Nigeria's president, Bola Ahmed Tunubu, who appointed members of other political parties in his cabinet to advance the nation's development. I'm waiting for the day where I will see him appointing credible members of the opposition to cabinet in Delta State, not only PDP members. In this country at this point in time where everything is not going very well, we need a cross-fertilization of ideas. It is only when we do that that we can move this country from one point to the other. Meanwhile, Governor Oberewori is here alongside top political stakeholders in the state, including two former governors, Imaru Lodwaga and Ifa Yokoa, to mark the first anniversary Thanksgiving of his administration. <laughs> Governor Borewori recounted how God gave him victory from the pre to post election in the 2023 general elections while pledging to advance the state's development through his more agenda. Oborewari debunked Ifan Yokoa's influence in the governance of the state against speculations of his involvement in his administration. The governor disclosed that his administration has turned the state into a huge construction site with 317 projects initiated across the state. There are 317 ongoing road projects over the state. Out of this, 76 roads with a relative length of 171.49 km and 85.30 length of bridge were initiated by this administration. <laughs> Few days from now, we shall commence the commissioning of some of these roads and other projects in other sectors for the world to see what we have accomplished in one year. The governor and his wife were joined by guests, including his deputy, to make special thanksgiving to God and thereafter caught the anniversary cake. In Asaba, for News Central, Austin Azu. Away from that, the governor of Plateau State, Caleb Mutfang, has unveiled a dashboard digital performance scorecard system of the state development framework. At the brief unveiling ceremony, the governor said it is a cardinal step in the state to drive progress, efficiency and effectiveness in governance. Nigeria's uh, News Central's uh, Chizo Banyonwe was there and now tells us more. The federal government had led the way with a similar initiative to basically hold public office holders accountable for the positions they hold and expectations from members. Now, Plateau State has stole the line, becoming the very first state in the Federation to roll out this innovation, a scorecard application for effectiveness and efficiency in work delivery. The SRDO and the development of this app is crucial in a time like this because the world at large is holding on to accountability, transparency, and strategy in planning and results-driven decision-making. Will there be challenges ahead? Governor Motfang is optimistic that this development would address all circumstances in the line of duty. The SRDO would also ensure a meaningful conceptual framework towards identifying and addressing all obstacles and challenges, tracking progress, and measuring the performance of all the MDS administrators. Allaying the fears of those who believe the performance scorecard is a tool for which hunting the government said it is rather to check the activities of public office holders for better service delivery. There is nothing being imposed on anybody, but everybody among, along the chain of command will be responsible and be commissioner. Governor will demand from commissioner. Commissioner will demand from from permanent secretary and so on and so forth. That is how governance is going to be, and everything is going to be open. Even the governor's office is on the platform. Even if you are not on seat. You can be able to uh, advance some information to the government. It tells you how effective utilization of government resources and budgetary, which is all geared towards effective result. It's about us now to measure because the leader of this mantra 
is not relying on his own. So it's ensuring that things are moving the right way. So I believe you that the crop of team he has we will sustain this and to continue. It is common knowledge that public office has always had a challenge of poor service delivery. How far this innovation will go in addressing that challenge is what everyone will have to patiently wait to see. In Jaws for New Central, Chizoba Anyowe. Talking about countering terrorism, a former Nigerian chief of army staff, Lieutenant General Tukor Burutai, retired, has called for a comprehensive strategy to address the complex challenges of national security in the country, stressing the importance of not only countering antisocial elements and terrorists, but also expanding and extending development to rural communities. He advocated for a holistic approach. New Central Samari Karawa completes the reports. A gathering that attracted stakeholders from the six states of the northeast of Nigeria. From technocrats, security experts, policy makers, former military generals, captains of industries, traditional and community leaders, among others. Nigeria's former army chief during the event emphasized the interconnectedness of security and development, stating that sustainable peace can only be achieved through a combination of responsive security measures and inclusive socio-economic progress. You have uh, attacks here and there, but it doesn't mean it is widespread as it was before we came and as at the time we immediately met it and they've been subdued. What is needed to be done is the continuous monitoring and handling them you know, appropriately. So it means nobody should raise on his own. So much has been achieved and as such uh, it must be maintained. Buratai maintained that addressing the socio-economic needs of marginalized areas will help to undermine the appeal of extremist ideologies and reduce the recruitment pool for terrorist groups. The foundation of every country lies on peace and justice. Other stakeholders also have this to say. I want uh, our people, particularly in Borno and in the Northeast, to believe in one another, to trust one another, to forgive one another. The Christian, the Muslim, the Gabadia, Atasha, Rokala, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, Domu, Asamu, Lafia, the Zaman Lafia. We want agriculture to be promoted and then the youth be provided with lots of job and then finally we want power civilians has our roles to play the way the way we are we are playing the roles that we are playing we need more people to come in and um, and, and play that role assist the nigerian military and also uh, well uh, use the non-kinetic means in order to to to, to, to regain peace Good governance through a holistic strategy involving security operations and community development is said to remain the cornerstone for sustainable peace. In Maiduguri for New Central, Umori Kirawa. And now to address the humanitarian needs in Bonanu State, the federal government of Nigeria has delivered 36,450 bags of emergency assorted food items to the state government. The relief materials, which include maize, millet and sorghum, were drawn from the National Strategic Reserve and are intended to support vulnerable populations in various communities. Again, New Central's Mark Rawa tells us more. The representative of the National Emergency Management Agency handed over the food items to the state governor, Professor Baba Ganazulum, at a ceremony held in Maiduguri, the Borno State capital. He stated that the federal intervention was a crucial step in providing immediate assistance to the affected communities in Borno State. We will recall that in fulfillment of this response to reduce the impact of the current economic downturn being experienced in the country, in line with the new hope agenda, Mr. President approved the need for the two metric tons of associated food commodities from the National Strategic Day Society. I want to express my sincere appreciation to the federal government under the leadership of President Bolaam of Tinubu for his continuous support to the less privileged people in our state, not only in our state, but in the northeastern states and in Nigeria in general. 
I want to commend the office of the Vice President. I want to commend Nema. I want to commend Sema. And I also want to commend the office of the National Security Advisor for this great initiative. The state government maintained that the relief materials will significantly contribute to the alleviation of the suffering experienced by the vulnerable people in Borno State. Apart from the good items, we have been receiving a lot of support from the federal government. And I think it's better for us than to support, not only in the area of food support, but we are also receiving additional funding from the federal government in order to strengthen the resilience of the community. The government is said to target hard to reach communities, particularly now that the rainy season has set in. Women head of household, uh, the ill head of household, uh, and also people with, with, with disability. These are the first target to be considered. Then the other, the most vulnerable population in the state. And also he said, okay, he's going to target uh, Kala Balge, because once the rainy season has uh, commenced, uh, accessing these areas is very, very terrible. It will not be very, very possible for uh, for them to get all what they require. So, uh, and other hard to reach locations, these are the modalities. As vulnerable persons in the state await the distribution of the assorted food items, the government enjoined them not to sell, but to utilize them. In my degree for New Central, Umoru Kirawa. A building collapse in Pakma Jao on the Ladipo axis of Lagos has resulted in the death of a 10-year-old, although the Lagos Emergency Management Agency has reported about three casualties. Members of the community say otherwise. The incident, which was reported by a human uh, error, occurred after an excavator collided with the community's central mosque at prayer time. New Central's Adisha Wadushoga reports. Residents of Papa Jao in the Ladipo axis of Moshin, Lagos State, were thrown into mourning following the collapse of the community's central mosque. The unfortunate incident, which was born out of a human error, was said to have occurred during the afternoon prayers while the road rehabilitation in the area was ongoing. According to victims and eyewitnesses, the two story building caved in after an excavator for road rehabilitation affected the pillar of the building after digging too deep to make way for the gutters, causing a crack and eventually a collapse. When we finished the prayer around 1, uh, 1.20, so trying to do a uh, little as car, so somebody came from the bank to say, look at the uh, ties, it's caving way. Wow. Car, okay, let us move to this side and take this other side to go out. As we step one, two, three, the thing was just running after us. I was hit here even at the back. Right now, I'm not feeling fine. However, contrary to the report by the Lagos State Emergency Management Agency that a total of three people died, the community members are insisting that only one person died from the incident and 17 others injured. It was pathetic. At 10 years old, the brain busted out completely. You understand? So we are able to pull the second person out too, the leg gone. I just saw a crack inside the mosque from up to down. I was very surprised that what kind of a crack is this like? This crack, eh, I just let me just go out. At the entrance, that was when the building just collapsed immediately. I just hear brrr, everything just collapsed on our head. But thank God that eh, the collapse did not come down totally. If to say the thing come down totally, so nobody will escape. Former Senator Ghani Olare Waju Solomon was at the site of the incident to sympathize with the community accompanied by the lawmaker representing the affected constituency. Where you have mosques, we have churches, you will have a lot of people coming there to do their prayers. And uh, for such a place, it is important that we put into consideration their lives and their properties. The local government was trying to build a road for our people. And there was this incident. It was an accident, majorly an accident. That's what we have been clamoring for, that we should always make uh, a setback for every structure we want to do. We need to follow those safety precautions, and we have to be proactive about it. What we are seeing is lack of uh, carelessness, negligence. While the damage caused by the accident cannot be undone, residents are asking for support for the affected victims and the provision of another site of worship 
following to the collapse of the mosque. In Lagos, for News Central, Adeshewa Odushoga. The news continues in West Africa, where Bubakar Traore, a close ally of Mali civilian Prime Minister Chogo Kokala Mega, has been detained after their political movement openly criticized the West African nation's military rulers. The M5 RFP movement on Friday released a strong statement against the colonels who seized power in 2020, further extending their role after they failed to meet a March deadline to hold elections and hand over power to a civilian government. The statement also opposed proposals to promote the colonels to the rank of generals and to launch talks with armed jihadists. Two sources confirmed that Traore, who signed the statement, has been detained. A member of his entourage said he was taken by intelligence agents from his office in the building housing the Prime Minister's services. And now in Central Africa, the government of Olamaye Halina, Chad's new prime minister, has been announced by the Secretary General of the Presidency, Mohamed Alabo, in Njamena. This is coming over two weeks after the May 6 presidential election won by General Mohamed Idris Debi Itno, head of the junta that has been in power for three years. Mohamed Alabo named Abdraman Kulamala as the foreign minister and government spokesperson and Abdurrahim Hamid as the Minister of State, Justice and Human Rights. Decree 002, Barper, Barpen, 2024, sur proposition du Premier ministre, chef du gouvernement, le Président de la République, chef de l'État, Président du Conseil des ministres, a nommé les personnalités suivantes, membres du gouvernement, et chargé des départements ci-après. Ministre des Affaires étrangères, de l'intégration africaine et des Tchadiens de l'étranger et de la coopération internationale, porte-parole du gouvernement, M. Abderrahman Polamala. Ministre d'État, ministre de la Justice et des Droits humains, garde des Sceaux, M. Abderrahim Breme Hamid. In sports, Nigeria's Super Eagles defender Leon Balogun has extended his deal with the Scottish League Giants Rangers. The 35-year-old returned to Ebrox last summer for a second spell after spending 12 months at the EFL Championship side QPR. Balogun spoke about his desire to extend his contract after Saturday's Scottish Cup final defeat to Celtic, and it appears his wish has been granted. The Nigerian international was at risk of joining a host of other out-of-contract stars heading for the exit door this summer at Clement, as Clement kickstarts his end-of-season scored overhaul. However, Balogun's performances have impressed his manager and has subsequently penned a deal that will see him continue with the club next season. Rwanda's head coach, Thorsten Frank Spittler, has stated that they are awaiting approval from world football governing body FIFA to allow former Lobby stars, now Bogesera FC striker Elijah Ani, to play for Amavubi in the upcoming June World Cup 2026 qualifiers against Benin Republic and Lesotho. The Amavubi tactician hailed the Nigeria Premier League football striker as an excellent player and a nice person who can help his team to greater heights, revealing that Rwanda FA is waiting for feedback from FIFA and he is optimistic that the laws governing players' nationality switch amended in April could stand in the players' favor to play for Amavubi. Spitler explained that he and his technical team watched games at various league centers across the country to spot Annie. And that's all at this hour, but before we go, we take a look at some of our major stories. Deposed Emmy of Kanu, Adobayero, others have been ordered to stop parading themselves as Emirs. Mali Junta has arrested ally of Prime Minister. We also told you that Chad government has announced new ministers.
You can send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number and email on your screen. Do follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. You can watch us live on DSTV, channel 422, Star Times, channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Likon Onobanjo.